Hi, my name is Tom Alberts. I'm an Associate Professor of Mathematics in the College of Science at the University of Utah. As part of the activities surrounding the 2020 Vice Presidential Debate being held at Kingsbury Hall, I'm here to tell you about a phenomenon called Condorcet's Paradox, also known as the Paradox of Voting. In short, Condorcet's Paradox says that whenever you have an election with three or more alternative choices, you might end up in a situation in which no one is happy with the outcome. The namesake of the paradox, the Marquis de Condorcet, was a French nobleman who lived in the 1700s and was a champion of constitutional government and equal rights for women and all races. His interests ranged from philosophy to mathematics, and he was a contemporary of both Benjamin Franklin and the great mathematician Leonard Euler. Now let me explain Condorcet's paradox with a simple example of an election that I'm sure many of us face almost daily, the question of what's for dinner tonight. Now in this example election, there's going to be three possible options for dinner, spaghetti, hamburger, and salad. And of course, in making the dinner choice, it's the kids that do the voting. In this case, there's going to be three voters, Tristan, Edwin, and Marius, who are some friends of mine. Each of the three submits a rank list of their preferences. So for example, Tristan prefers spaghetti first, then hamburger, then salad, whereas Edwin's choices are hamburger first, then salad, then spaghetti, and Marius prefers salad, then spaghetti, then hamburger. Now, given these preferences, to get the results of the election, we just start comparing the alternatives pairwise. So for example, spaghetti beats hamburger because Tristan and Marius both prefer spaghetti to hamburger, and Edwin, well, he just loses that vote. At the same time, hamburger beats salad, because Tristan and Edwin both prefer hamburger to salad, and Marius, he loses that vote. So at this point, it seems like spaghetti beats hamburger, and hamburger beats salad, so spaghetti wins, right? But of course, that's not the full story, because you haven't yet put salad up against spaghetti. And if you do that, you see that both Edwin and Marius prefer salad to spaghetti, and Tristan loses that vote. And that's where we start to see the paradox. We have that spaghetti is preferred to hamburger, hamburger is preferred to salad, but salad is preferred to spaghetti. As a result, there is no clear aggregate ranking of the preferences, and we can't decide who wins the dinner vote. This is despite the fact that each of the three kids had a clear ranking of the preferences. But the problem is when we combine them together, we can't decide who should win. When this happens, we draw the output in this circular form. And as a result, we call this kind of outcome a Condorcet cycle. The Condorcet cycle nicely shows why this type of outcome is a paradox. Despite the fact that each voter had a clear ranking of the three options, the majority wishes can be in conflict with each other. In our example, two-thirds of voters preferred spaghetti to hamburger, two-thirds preferred hamburger to salad, and two-thirds preferred salad to hamburger. A paradox. Now, whenever a Condorcet cycle occurs in an election, and it's not guaranteed that it always does, the person who is responsible for tallying the votes can make the outcome appear to be whatever they want. Here's how it would work in our dinner example. Suppose the parent secretly wants salad to win. To make this happen, first put spaghetti against hamburger. In that case, because two out of three children prefer spaghetti to hamburger, spaghetti will win. Now, take the winner, spaghetti, and put spaghetti against salad. In that case, two out of three kids preferred salad to spaghetti, so salad wins, and the parent gets what they wanted. But if the parent had wanted hamburger to win, they could have done the same thing. First put salad against spaghetti, and then salad will win, and then put hamburger against the winner, salad, and hamburger will win. As a result, the parent gets the hamburger that they secretly wanted. And of course, had the parent wanted spaghetti to be chosen, they could have made that happen too. So whenever a Condorcet cycle occurs, it automatically gives a disproportionate amount of power to the person who gets to choose the order in which the votes are tallied. 
This explains some of the power held by figures such as the Speaker of the House or the Senate Majority Leader, who get to choose the order in which legislation is voted upon. In the example election, it was very easy for a Condorcet cycle to appear because there were only three voters casting votes. In a more realistic election, with many thousands of voters casting votes, one might think that a Condorcet cycle is a very rare phenomenon. And in fact, this kind of turns out to be the case. So now I'm going to explain what the odds are of a Condorcet cycle appearing in an election with essentially infinitely many voters, but still only three possible options to vote on. Now I'm going to call them A, B, and C. Now with three possible options to vote on, there are six possible rankings of these options, and we assume that every voter chooses exactly one of these rankings. Now suppose I know the percentage of voters who chose each of those six possible rankings. I'm going to use a little algebra here and denote those percentages by x. The subscript indicates the actual ranking. So for example, xcba is the percentage of voters who preferred c first, b second, and a third. Since these are percentages, these six x numbers all have to be positive, and of course they have to sum up to 100%. Now in order for a Condorcet cycle to appear, in which a majority of voters prefer A to B, and a majority of voters prefer B to C, yet paradoxically a majority of voters still prefer C to A, what we need is that at least 50% of the voters prefer A to B, 50% prefer B to C, and 50% prefer C to A. But of course, since we already know the percentage of voters that prefer each of these rankings, we can easily use that to compute the percentage of voters that prefer A to B, for example. It's just the percentage of voters that prefer A first, B second, and C third, or maybe A first, B third, with C in the middle, or maybe C first, with A second, and B third. Similarly, we can use those numbers to compute the percentage of voters that prefer B to C, and the percentage of voters that prefer C to A. The algebra explains how it's possible that these three numbers are each bigger than 50%, even though the six numbers they come from all had to add up to 100%. So this math easily explains when a Condorcet cycle happens, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a Condorcet cycle always happens. For example, if all 100% of voters chose A, then B, then C, then of course there's no Condorcet cycle. But of course the Condorcet cycle may appear in some elections, and we would like to know what are the odds of that happening. There are some techniques in probability theory that we can use to calculate these types of odds. Here's one such calculation. Suppose that before the election we have absolutely no guess as to what percentage of voters will choose each of the six possible rankings. That is, each of the six possible rankings will be chosen by a completely random percentage of voters, subject to the constraint that, of course, all percentages have to add up to 100%. In that case, using probability, we calculate that there is a 6.25% chance of a Condorcet cycle occurring during the election. Not a huge percentage, but also not nothing. Political scientists know that it's actually difficult to find a real-world election in which a Condorcet cycle occurs. Partly that's because not all elections occur with at least three alternatives. Often it's just with two alternatives in which the majority vote prevails. One could argue, however, that the 2016 presidential election, especially the results in Utah, produced something that might have been a Condorcet cycle. That's because there was a viable third-party candidate in Evan McMullen who managed to capture 21% of the total vote. There were other third-party candidates as well. If you add up the Trump, Clinton, and McMullen percentages here, you only end up with 93.6% of the electorate. But to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that was the entire electorate. Now, given this data, we don't know for sure whether or not a Condorcet cycle occurred, because we only know the first choice percentages of the voters. For example, we don't know what percentage of Trump voters would have preferred Clinton second and then McMullen third. But we can make some guesses. For example, we might presume that all 27% of Clinton voters would have preferred McMullen over Trump. That would mean that McMullen 
captures 48% of the vote to Trump's 45%. And as a result, in the pairwise majority vote preference, McMullen is preferred to Trump. At the same time, among McMullen voters, we might expect that enough of them would prefer Trump over Clinton, such that in the pairwise majority vote, Trump would be preferred to Clinton. The harder question to answer is who the second choice would be among most Trump voters. Most likely it would be McMullen, but for the sake of argument, let's say that enough of them prefer Clinton over McMullen, for example, because they don't want to vote for a third party candidate. In that case, it might, we can see that we might actually complete the Condorcet cycle. Now this type of scenario might be pure fantasy, but we can again use math to determine the odds of it actually happening. Using the same model as before, in which the percentage of voters who choose each of the six possible rankings is completely random, but now subject to the constraint that the total first choice preferences are actually what was observed in the election, so this data right here, that model computes that there was a 6.91% chance of this Condorcet cycle appearing. Of course, 6.91 is not very big, but it's still slightly bigger than the 6.25 we computed when we had no idea of what the first choice percentages would be. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this explanation of some of the interesting math that can happen during elections. To find out more about the College of Science, visit our website at science.utah.edu.